Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Arkham CPD conference. My name is Hisham Ibrahim. I'm one of the emergency medicine consultants in Hampshire Hospital. And uh, today we're going to be talking about pediatric ECGs. So to be honest, when I've been asked by the organizing committee of the conference to cover the pediatric ECGs in 12 minutes, I felt that this is a, quite a big challenge. Uh, it is a big topic um, to talk about in 12 minutes. But when I started preparing my slides, I felt like, you know what, I'm just going to raise the challenge level. So what I will do is I'm going to start by talking, uh, talking about an adult case. So something that we are far more familiar with, you're sitting in your ED department and then you've been asked by one of the nurses to check an ECG for a patient who's uh, coming with shortness of breath, 20 year old female. Uh, so that happens to all of us every day. And um, when you try to check the ECG, this is what you found. So that's the ECG that you've been asked to check. And if you look at this one, I can clearly see really concerning features here. So going through this ECG to start with, we've got a fast heart rate that looks like sinus tachycardia. We've got a right bonded branch block picture. We've got in uh, a, a right axis deviation here. And uh, we've got a deep S wave in lead one and a bit of a Q wave in lead three without a T wave inversion. So we've got an S1. Q3. So when we combine all these together, in addition to the T wave inversion that we can see in V1 to V3, that is really concerning. So sinus tachy, right axis, right bundle, S1, Q3, T wave inversion, and V1 to V3. In presence of shortness of breath, I'll be definitely thinking pulmonary embolism here. So what happens then if you suddenly get that from the same nurse. I'm really sorry, I've got the ECGs mixed up. The ECG you've just seen is for a two month old girl. It is not for a 20 years old girl. How are you gonna feel? So to be honest, I would feel really anxious when I hear this. And I've had a chat with some of my colleagues and even our pediatric colleagues, they don't feel that comfortable with pediatric ECGs. And that's for many reasons. So I think first of all, we, our experience in ED is far more with the adult ECGs. We do not see that high number of pediatric ECGs on daily basis compared to the adult ECGs that we just see every few minutes. So that is a big difference. The other thing is there are so many differences between the adult ECG and the pediatric ECG that um, many things that we will see as a very abnormal in adults are just counted as normal in, in peds. And the third difference is the fact that even within the pediatric population, a slight change in the age will make a big change in the ECG. So it is not like a one rule that fits all um, in peds. So I think because of all these reasons, we don't feel that comfortable interpreting pediatric ECGs. But I think there are ways around that. And the first way is just to have a structured approach. So my personal um, view of seeing ECGs, I've got one single approach that I use for adult ECGs and pediatric ECGs, and it is the same one. So I start looking at the QRS and I ask myself four questions. What's the rate doing? What's the rhythm doing? What's the width like? And what's the axis doing? Then I move on to the P waves and its relationship to the QRS. Then I move on to the intervals and I check both PR interval and QT intervals. Then I move on to chambers for enlargement. So I check for right and left atrial enlargement, right and left ventricular enlargement. And then I check for signs of ischemia, that is checking the ST segment, the T waves and the Q waves. And lastly, anything else that would catch my eye, like a J wave or movement artifacts or whatever. So, uh, so this is my approach. With, uh, with the ECG interpretation in adults and in peds, it is the same one. The other important thing to be aware of is basically when it comes to pediatric ECGs, what's normal, what's not. So the biggest difference is the fact that during neonatal life, so basically during the fetal life and in neonates and infants, the right ventricle is the dominant one. It is bigger and thicker than the left ventricle. So that is the most important 
factor that will help us to understand the difference between the adults and uh, the peds when it comes to ECG interpretation. And by time, the left ventricle will just start gradually getting bigger and thicker and it dominates. To get a bit more, understa more understanding of this, we're just gonna quickly go through the fetal circulation. So uh, this is what's gonna help us to understand exactly what happens. So to start with, we're gonna start from here. This is the placenta that gives the oxygenated blood to the fetus through the umbilical vein. Then this blood will keep going through the ductus venosa until it reaches the IVC and then the right atrium. Once reached the right atrium, then some of it is gonna go through the foramen ovale to the left atrium, but most of it is gonna to go to the right ventricle, which will try to push it through to both lungs via the pulmonary artery. And here is the biggest difference between the, um, the neonate or between the, um, the uh, fetus and the adult. Both lungs in the fetus are out of action. They are full of amniotic fluid and uh, they're not really um, used for breathing. So because of that, the pulmonary vasculatures are very constricted and the pressure within the lung areas are really high for the blood. So the right ventricle would really struggle to push through to both lungs. And what will happen is it will be much easier for the blood to go through the ductus arteriosus from the pulmonary artery to the water. Then it will start supplying head and neck and the rest of the body via the descending aorta. So if we think about it, the right ventricle in the, um, in the fetus is actually functioning as a left ventricle in adults. It is supplying the blood to the whole body. And that's why it is bigger and thicker than the left one. So moving on to the differences between adults and peds. First thing to be aware of is that the normal values when, when it comes to the heart rate is very different. So kids are generally faster and the younger, the faster. And, um, and we all know that. Second difference is that all intervals and durations are shorter in adults, compare, uh, shorter in peds compared to adults, except the QT. So when we think about the PR interval, they will be counted as prolonged when they exceed four small squares rather than five in adults. The QRS is narrower and with higher voltage in peds. So any QRS voltage that is more than two small squares, that will be counted as a wide complex that is up to the age of eight years old. But the other difference is the QT, which is a little bit different. The QTC is normally, it can go up to 490, up to the age of six months. So the QT is normally longer in peds, younger uh, compared to the adults. So as a general rule, let's take that note. The QTs of the QTs are longer normally. So let's move on. We know that the right ventricle is the dominant one, and we know now why it is thicker than the left. Based upon this, that will affect the ECG dramatically. You will get a right axis deviation based upon that, and you will get a tall R or RSR dash in V1 and V2, you are gonna get a right bundle branch block picture in the ECG. And that is because of the difference in thickness between right and left compared to adults. And by time, the left ventricle will start getting more developed and it will gradually, uh, the axis will gradually progress to be a normal axis and the right bundle will gradually uh, disappear. So that is the third difference between adult ECGs and pediatric ECGs. Fourth one is the pseudo ischemia. So if we check for the pediatric ECGs, we will notice that they normally have a small Q wave that might be seen in the inferior leads and lateral leads, but they should be small. They shouldn't be a big Q wave. They should be less than five millimeters. There is also the T wave inversion that we normally see in pediatric ECGs from V1 to V3. They can stay up to the age of 15 and they're called juvenile T wave pattern. So be aware about a couple of things here. The T wave in V1 starts upright in the first seven days of life. Then it gets inverted and it stays inverted up to the age of seven years old. So from seven days old to seven years old, the T wave in V1 should be inverted. 
If you see it upright before the age of seven, this is very abnormal. So if you see a, a, a T wave like what we see in here, in uh, V1 uh, to V3, that in an adult, I would ignore it and count it normal as upright. In a child that is less than seven years old, but more than seven days old, that is very abnormal. That's a sign of right ventricular uh, hypertrophy. The T wave can stay uh, for life inverted in V1. Second thing to be aware of is that the T wave inversion from V1 to V3, um, the juvenile T wave pattern, can stay, can, can stay in an adulthood uh, um, during the adulthood life. And it's called persistent juvenile T wave pattern. And that happens especially in the Afro-Caribbean females. So moving on with pediatric ECGs, you need to get a bit more um, uh, leads. So you need to cover the right side of the heart and uh, you need to cover the posterior wall of the heart. And that is to help you with covering the congenital problems. So if we go back to our ECG, actually, the right bundle, the right axis, the S1, Q3, the sinus tachy and the T wave inversion that will make us think about PE are actually completely normal in that age group for a two month old. So in summary, pediatric ECGs are the same as adults when it comes to the approach. When you look at an ECG and find signs of pulmonary embolism, this is either pulmonary embolism, ECG, or a normal ECG if it is for a child. T waves in V1 should be inverted from seven days old to seven years old. And all the intervals and durations are shorter in pediatric ECGs than in adults, except the QTs of the QTs. They are longer. Thank you very much for this. I'm just gonna leave you with my two boys when they were cute, and I'm more than happy to get your questions when it comes to the QA session. Thank you.